Okay, go ahead. Testing one, two, three, yes. testing one, two, three. Okay. <laughs> My name is Guthrie Ford. Today we'll be interviewing Mr. Bird Lee Minter Jr. of Monroe, Louisiana. Mr. Minter was formerly of Aransas Pass, Texas. We will be discussing today uh, primarily his dad, Mr. Bird Lee Minter Sr., who was a charter boat captain, a fisherman, um, a bayman um, in Aransas Pass uh, and Port Aransas both. We're in the home of Mr. Mark Crichton, and this is the first of uh, probably two to three interviews. And this will run approximately an hour and 15 minutes. And uh, good afternoon, sir. How are you? Oh, <laughs> just relax. And as you start talking, where this might be a little bit different than a normal conversation is that on occasion I will, I will come into what you're saying and say thank you so that we can move to another topic in order that we, uh, we don't, everyone has a tremendous amount to say understandably, but we're just in the restraints of, of certain times. I had read the letters that you had sent us, specifically the letter regarding a remembrance of a father, yes. which you had written in May of 09, and you sent a document regarding your dad um, relative to the Port Aransas Boatman's Incorporated, uh, Mr. Bird Minter, and I had read this document. Okay, good. So this is uh, what I have done in terms of my homework. Before we start, I have a picture here, okay. and Mark and I would like to get some names associated with it. Okay. The person I'm pointing to here, I presume, is your dad. That's dad on the bottom. I presume this is you? No, that I'm not in the picture. That yeah. is Herbie Jr. Herbie Toombs Jr. Herbert, I guess. Toombs? Toombs, T O O M B S. Mr. Toombs, Jr. Is he a friend? <laughs> yes, very much. Very much part of my dad's life. Okay. And the younger folks? Uh, the other boy, the tall boy in the green, uh, is his son, Lee. Lee Toombs? Lee Toombs. And that would be Lee Toombs' son, the young that boy? Is Lee Toombs' son. I believe I, I had it in the notes. It'll be Cl Carlton Clayton or something like that. That's fine. I'll put yeah. Mr. Toombs' uh, grand, grandson. grandson. And Mr. Toombs. Mr. Toombs had passed away probably in the mid to late 50s. Okay. This is a. That is another story which is very interesting who he was. I can imagine. This is a fascinating photo. Um, it's a beautifully done piece of work. The fish is extraordinarily well articulated as a sailfish. Can you tell me a little bit about this photograph? That was taken by one of my friends just recently. I have misplaced a picture, the only one we had, of my nephew who was down guiding from deck end for dad. And they were out uh, fishing around a uh, drift and catching a little dolphin on fly line. And uh, Gary hooked the, uh, it flipped the line out for the customer and hooked the sailfish and he got so excited he wouldn't give the pole to the, one of the paying customers and he wound up landing the fish and uh, of course the people didn't want it and uh, dad had it mounted and it's uh, in my possession. And that's the mount? Yes. And this was taken recently, or? Yeah, that was taken just in the last month. Right, right. And so that fish uh, is in your home in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And that fish was caught, say again, the, the fisherman who landed that fish. My nephew. Okay. He was probably 21, 22 years okay. old. He and his brother had deck in for dad. Okay. As well as the boy in that other photo, Lee, as a youngster growing up. Lee kind of took my place when I left home, and uh, he would come down and spend the summer with Mother and Dad, and he would be Dad's deck in, and then he'd come pick up Dad in an airport. Go ahead. That's another subject. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, outstanding, as I said a little bit earlier to you, the outstanding uh, contribution you made to uh, your grandfather, 
and to the um, enterprise that he established in Aransas Pass, nothing short of uh, the shrimp shrimping industry. We were interested in what GE, the initials GE stood for. Granville Elias. And I guess that's the reason he was called Bill. And that would be G-R-A-N-B-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And Elias, as from the Bible, E-L-I-A-S. Yes. And Bill then isn't a derivative of those names. It was just a nickname he picked up. We don't know. <laughs> um, Mark and I, in reading this fine um, attribute, uh, tributation, we wondered whether the fishing or the shrimping was inshore, bay fish, bay offshore. Where was the shrimping that Mr. Minter did? Basically, once they started, it was out in the Gulf. I think I have it mentioned, in other words, no more than maybe three or four miles down Mustang or three or four miles up St. Joe, because they'd go out four or five o'clock in the morning and be home by 10, 11 with a load of shrimp. And also, would that be uh, five miles, 10 oh, miles? Oh, no, or? heavens. Half a mile. Three Half a mile. mile, so just really yeah. dragging, dragging the, mm -hmm. uh, dra right beyond the third bar or so, which is yeah. just not that far And off. the first shrimp, really were caught in cast nets, primarily in Corpus Pass. And uh, they, his first shrimp, as it said, I think over there were shipped to uh, George Jordan Shrimp Market, uh, Fish Market in San Antonio. I think Mr. George was kin to Granddad in some way. Right. And uh, he would, uh, then when he realized they were good to eat, he began to put them in a uh, little, onion bags, about 10 pounds, stick them on top of the fish barrel and with a little note or something to them to the fish, to the recipient of the barrel and say, uh, here's a way to cook them, they're good to eat, let's see if we can establish a market. I mean, that was basically it. And so that's the way the shrimp market originated. And so he was... But he was already well established in shipping fish, primarily redfish and flounder. Would you tell me a little bit about that and where he took his redfish and flounder and how he took them? Did he do it how by trot lines or was he... Oh, no, uh, Granddad basically was a buyer of the fish from the fishermen. Mm -hmm. There immediately, as I understand, some of the old men were still around 30 years later when I was a youngster. They had a little rowboat, long Calcutta stick, maybe a little piggy book that, and they would go out in the uh, Redfish Bay, I guess you call it, over here back at Dagger Point, mm -hmm. the old terminal, all the way over, over where they could row. And they would come in with a barrel or two of redfish and gut and gill them and weigh them and get paid, and they would pack them into barrels and ice and uh, ship them off when they got a car load. And then there were immediately developed uh, different people, call them different things, tremor nets, gill nets, drag seines, and they began to fish that way. And at the time of the mounting of the monument we built, there was a fellow there that had a show called Redfish, something like that. And uh, while I was making my little presentation, I said, why don't you come and interview the man that can tell you about red fishing. And he said, what do you mean? And I pointed over toward Dagger Point. And I said, uh, Dad, what was it? Uh, 60,000 pounds you wrapped up one night? And Dad stood up and said, yeah, that was all we weighed in. Mm. And then I pointed over to Ransom Island and I said, back of Ransom Island Hole, uh, Dad, how many pounds was it? And he had come up to the mic and he said, well, Papa would only take 110,000 pounds because he had flooded the market and we uh, fish were dying in the net. We had been working on them for three or four days, getting them out. And uh, so I looked at the guy and I said, now you can talk 
to the master mm -hmm. about redfish. He never did. Mm -hmm. Now, what year was that that you're talking about? What I era? I'm going to kind of guess on that, but that would have been in the early days, probably pre-1920. Mm -hmm. In other words, fish was his primary market to begin with. It was probably about three or four years before he started in 1909. And it was three or four years before he really established these shrimp business. And when he did, he immediately built, I don't remember where, three or four shrimp boats. And uh, I don't know who made the nets. And uh, he would hire people to run them. And then within a very short time, maybe a, three or four other people built boats. And as is recorded in uh, newspaper articles, he had a captive market for 13 years before Mrs. Massey, who was the matriarch over Old Ingleside, whose son, only son, married my dad's baby sister. She began to establish her market. And then Mr. Johnson from Rockport, somewhere in the same time. So as the record is in the paper that Granddad said, or either one of my aunts said in helping the interview, that uh, Papa had a 13-year, mm -hmm. well. the only market that, you know, of the shrimp. Right. So. Uh, uh, no longer there, Gulf King was an extraordinarily large shrimping enterprise in Aransas Pass. Was that after your Granddad, or? Yes. Gulf King was in Corpus after they had seen. I can remember, so I'm going to put a date on it, of 1938, 39. There was no seawall. The New Aces Hotel, the back of it was the beach. And uh, then after they built the seawall, probably in 44, 45, somewhere right in there, they built those three piers that are still there. So Gulf King started shrimping there, or his shrimp boats. And I don't know, he didn't have a very large fleet, but they finally, the city finally ran him off, so to speak, and Mayor Con Brown, we had, by that time, had built the first phase of Con Brown Harbor, which is about a third of what it is today, the far eastern end of it. He invited, what was his name? I can't even remember now, Gulf King. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, he invited him to come here to work out of there. So that was the origin of Gulf King. And when you say Oasis Hotel, you're talking about the old Oasis Hotel on the North Shore in Corpus, mm -hmm. North Beach? It was right on Main Street, and the back door of it, you could walk down to the beach. All right. All right. Okay. I mean, I can remember that as a youngster. Right. Some of Dad's customers or something that stayed there, and we'd go over and go swimming on the beach. When did Bill Mentor expire? You know, I finally found that date of 68. I believe I have it in that. Uh, I didn't see it. No, I have it in a newspaper article where my aunt had written birth date and a death date at the top of it. And your dad worked for worked for his dad? In that essence, yes. Yeah. yeah. In other words, he started taking people out with a rowboat, charging them when he was eight years old. And I'm going to say probably right at that time was when he and Mr. Howe developed a relationship. And that would be Mr. G. A. C. Huff mm -hmm. of San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. Do you know what G? Uh, do you know what his initials stand for, or any one of them? All I know, he was called Gacho. He had a very close association. I believe he even had a ranch down in Mexico. And then he had a nice little ranch southeast of San Antonio. That is a total story within itself. Mm -hmm. And then his friend Dave Pryor, who lived in Uvalde, also had land in Mexico. 
and Cassie Jack Garner lived next door to Mr. Pryor in Uvalde. And then Uncle Ben Franklin, what I always called him, lived next door. So these three people lived there. And they were a part of Daddy's life as far as, I'm going to say, you know, before he was even a teenager. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, of course, he and Mr. Have had a relationship for many years. He had decades. a relationship. <laughs> Dad had a relationship with him that he could write a check, buy land for him. <laughs> uh, Dad was the source of a little inside information about the future dredging of the seawall, uh, resulting in Mr. House buying the land where those houses are. Mm -hmm. uh, Dad went up to this ranch up close to San Antonio, building duck blinds, you know, before the duck season. On, on the tanks up there? And yeah, on a lake that Mr. Howell had okay. built. And he's had his stock for bass. Mm -hmm. And then in the duck season, he would lower the lake a little bit so you could wade through it, pick up your ducks. And Dad would load up that, uh, well, I don't know how he did it in the early days, but that trailer that hauled the boat on it. Mm -hmm load it down with bay brush and hauled it up there and build uh, the duck blinds. Mm -hmm. And I was, oh, probably 45, 46, 47. I made three trips up there with him to build duck blinds. And mm -hmm. some of the people that were there one time, uh, Dad is, he won't let you go until you tell him who you are. And uh, they were there in military fatigues and Dad said, what do you do for the government. One of them said, I fly airplanes and I work for the president and that was Secretary Statinius and the other one was uh, the first chief of Air Force after they separated the Air Force. Army Air Force. I forget his name now, but they were there and uh, said dad just wouldn't let them loose until they told him who they were. <laughs> and you know, as a kid, even 14, 15 years old. Hey, you don't find people of that caliber out on a little ranch all by themselves. No. <laughs> so what they were discussing is anybody's <laughs> supposition. Uh, speaking of um, VIPs, uh, you have a sentence in the uh, one of your uh, remembrance papers. I quote, a charter fishing chapter for 72 years. He, Lee, Bird Lee, chartered into the Gulf for 62 years. Those who boarded his boats were a Mexican president. Can you think of who that might have been? That occasion happened in Wymus. Okay. When one of the trips, I think the first trip, right. uh, Mr. Half said had connections all over Mexico. Okay. And he had invited the president down. Okay. And there were other dignitaries, movie stars. Right. It was a hideout for certain people. Right. Uh, uh, after that, there's a comma. The next uh, uh, personages were two future U.S. presidents. Can you think who they might be? Yeah, been? just give me a second. I have it written in my raw notes. Uh, LBJ was a... And then Eisenhower. Those would be two of them. And I almost but I'm not going to say it for the record that uh, Bush Sr. Okay, so these folks, um, LBJ, Dwight David Eisenhower, and uh, Bush G.W. Sr. I say that with reservations. Okay, but your, your understanding, that at least the first two, LBJ yeah. and Mr. Eisenhower, and Mr. Eisenhower. Fished, fished, your dad fished them. No, they were not fishing customers. They were... Eisenhower was hauled over to St. Joe Island by Mr. Sid, uh, Richard Clayburg, and uh, uh, Speaker of the House, William Rayburn, to convince him that he was a Republican. <laughs> and if you will run for president, we'll put you in office. And here's three things we want, and that's another story. But Mr. Sid didn't really have a nice boat. He had a work boat and an old, old ferry boat. And he hired Dad to, 
take people over to the island for that okay. political rendezvous. So can, let me, can I say this again? In order for Mr. Eisenhower to get to the ranch house on St. Joe, said Richardson's oh, house, then um, Mr. Richardson engaged your dad to boat uh, Ike over to St. Joe. Okay. I mean, it just makes some notes there. And something like that happened numerous times because Dad knew Mr. Sid from years and years, probably as a young teenager, I guess. What was the circumstance involving LBJ? He was down here back in the days he was still a school teacher. And uh, party <laughs> and uh, dad took a bunch of school teachers playboys for a boat ride <laughs> okay so we would say LBJ was a joyride okay on the Lucille the boat that he had had built in 39 so. yes I want to get to those boats that just sound yeah, so superb and if, that period of time. if we uh, will just consider Mr. Bush Sr. for just a moment, what would be the circumstances for George W.H.? When George Jr., call him that, came politicking to run for governor, he came to the nursing home. And that would be like, what, 95 or 96. Dad passed away in 97, November. Uh -huh. And he was, you know, shaking hands, politicking for the people in the nursing home, and Dad did his typical, stuck his hand out and, to shake your hand and pull it back, and so I'm told people there finally said, Son, I shook your dad's hand when they were dirty and greasy. If you promise me you will become president, I'll shake your hand and vote for you. <laughs> so that's what they told me at the nursing home right. case. So right. Dad saying I shook your dad's <laughs> hand <laughs> back when he was an oil man. <laughs> the oil people that Dad had, they were his principal customers, so I just have to kind of make an assumption there. Uh, and the last uh, personage was the abdicated, abdicated King of England. Okay, the uh, abduct... Uh, yeah. I got the word right, but I can't say it. The abducted. Abdicated. Abdicated. Okay, he and his wife were at the old La Posada Inn, the Taft home over here out of Gregory. I don't know that one. Okay. When you go on the old road up to Gregory right now, just before you get to the uh, 35, I guess it is, yeah. you'll see a archway. They've changed a lot. They've I'm going to say in the lot. last 10 years, it was still there. Okay. They've changed a lot in the last okay. year. Okay, yeah. And that was the entranceway to the La Posada. La Posada. And he was there. And uh, Dad and Mr. Cyrus Farley went over. And Mrs. Farley went over. But Mother would not go over. She was going to stay home with her boys, and Mrs. Farley and involved with some cooks to cook the meal for the ex-king and his wife. And Dad and Mr. Farley were over there. I don't know what they were over there for, but they were patrons of that place because there were many of the Texas elite who came there to go fishing eventually or duck hunting with Dad, and so he was a patron of that place. And uh, I'll certainly check the history books on this, but I think we're referring to the British uh, English royalty that abdicated the yeah. uh, throne to marry an American That's woman. Right. Yeah. right. Was that Edward? Well, Wallace Simpson. Was it, yeah, is it Edward? S Prince Edward? Simpson was her last. Simpson. Edward. Did oh, yeah. Was it Edward? Was the yeah. mm -hmm. king apparent? There's some pictures over in the ranches, you know, of that. I've seen them. As I say, in a ranch, most everybody lost all their pictures, and most of the old pictures you see in the ranches were pictures that my dad's stepmother, his mother died when he was six, 
that she had sent copies to Stephenville. And she still had her connection. Well, Dad, Granddaddy did too, so they recovered her pictures up there to make pictures that eventually became the historical pictures of Rats Pass. The expression, the Mentor Fish House, was that your granddad's headquarters? Was that his, his packing plant? Was that uh, his doc, or was it a... As you, and I can't ever remember the names of the streets, that I, but as you come over the seawall, the old, remember the old red barn? Mm -hmm. Well, the next block is where you come through the seawall, coming to Port of Ranches, Harbor Island. Okay, come down one block. Granddad had built a house after the 1919 hurricane on the beach. Then when they built the seawall, they jacked it up, and that was the house on top of the seawall. That was their home. Oh, as you came over the seawall, you came down, and that was his fish house. And, of course, I don't remember, in other words, the seawall and the waterfront was built in 22, 20, 21, 22. But uh, that was the, you come in in the ranch's channel, and you just barely made a bend and you pulled into his fish house. Mm -hmm. So that was it. Now prior to the Arakan, it was just on the beach about maybe a hundred feet back to the south. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, originally uh, it was just a wharf. See, as the channel, channel came in, it was just a basin. And he had built a wharf out to deep water. Mm -hmm. And the boats would come in with their fish and they'd put them on a little cart and move it up to the fish house mm -hmm. that was on the beach. But the fish house I'm referring to is the one that was built after the channel and mm -hmm. the seawall and, and that. Did the San Antonio and Aranges Pass Railroad, was, did that run close to either of those facilities you've yeah, mentioned? It ran exactly where the uh, parallel, yeah. That so was. it was easy, easy. Yeah, you know, the gap in the seawall used to be just a little bit this way. And then, I don't know who built it, but when they built the seawall, of course you had a bridge going to Port Aranges with the railroad on it. Then there was a bridge that went over to this island, more or less, where the marine waves are now. And that's where Granddad built his first home and downstairs was a bathhouse, and the upstairs was their, quote, summer home. And uh, then he had the dock down on the mainland. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you had two bridges across the channel there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know whether who owned the land, whether Granddad just leased it or mm -hmm. what, but some of the piling are still there. Mm -hmm. If you'll note that old rusty galvanized mm -hmm. building, mm -hmm. some of the piling on the uh, south end of it well, mm -hmm. are still there. Mm -hmm. That's, that is nice. Yeah. There is no question in my mind that your, your dad was very instrumental at bringing offshore fishing into this area. And give us a little bit of the background of how that came to be. Um, was it your granddad's interest? Was it Mr. Haif wanting to do that? Give us a little bit of the... If Mr. Haif was a venturer, <laughs> I know he had the speedboat, the Ghost, and he had another boat, it was a longer boat, kind of like a sleepy boat, quarters, a playboat, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. And it burned up, and then he bought the Olita. And I'm going to guess about 32, 33. Mm -hmm. In 1937, a fellow came in from San Pedro, I think I said San Diego, but it was San Pedro, heard about Granddad's shrimp market and wanted to make arrangements to ship shrimp mm -hmm. to uh, California. And uh, Dad got to talking to him about uh, bill fishing. And, uh, Dad said he'd see them and catch them occasionally when they were out snapper fishing on what we used to call hospital and little hospital. Mm -hmm. There are two 
bunches of rocks out there. They, they're still there. Still there, and I'm sure they got a buoy on them, or everybody yeah. knows how they're all on their GPS system. And uh, so this fellow said, well, they're all over, you know, the West Coast, and particularly the Baja, and uh, a town of Wyamus was the closest town to the Nogales, let's say, and uh, he said, I think you can get down there, you know, with a truck and a boat. And so Dad talked to Mr. Half and uh, Dave Pryor and let's go. So they made the but, but if, if, if I may interrupt just a second, before this event, what do you remember your dad saying, or what do you remember about the amount of offshore fishing people were doing in Port Aransas? In other words, was it organized? Was it informal? Was it was it still the tarpon game? Was that still the game? Yes. The boats, as I remember, the majority of them were just open cockpit boats. And you know, they were out there for tarpon fishing. You catch mackerel and kingfish right at the end of the jetty. Uh, you may go down the beach a mile or two, or a mile or two that way, the tarpon seem to be congregating on the north jetty. And as far as people going, quote, offshore, to the whistling buoy was, huh, no. Did I, no, because Dad just made the, you know, the remark that uh, there's two guys that he finally talked into going out sail fishing, they were scared that he couldn't get them back because they go out of sight of land. So, now there were, several of the boats out of ranches that would go out snapper fishing. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were probably just shrimp boats that were mm -hmm. you know, going out during the off season, mm -hmm. as Dad probably did. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they weren't big boats either. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, people no bigger than our little bay boats we have today. Now, I've read about Florida Roberts going offshore in the Trailblazer snapper fishing, and you just ran a certain compass course for a certain number of minutes and then you then you do some soundings that's yeah, that's, that's exactly, exactly what it. they did that's exactly it so you think you 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 would think that it is, it was the technology of the day or the lack of technology of the day that keep people that kept people in shore and the lack of boats and the lack of a, the suitable type of boat and i guess you'd say people that had the courage to go offshore right. and uh not knowing really what's out there. I mean, you could catch all of the, the tarpon, the kingfish, the mackerel, the, uh, the dolphin, the uh, snook, and the uh, jackfish. <laughs> right. Right. right at the end of the jetty. I yeah. mean, many of the boats went out, came in for lunch, and went back out in the afternoon. <laughs> I mean, you know, so you didn't go very far. Even in the 49 and 50, when I ran a private boat, it was a 28 foot twin scoop fish craft. We just go out to the end of the jetty, maybe down a mile or two, or half a mile, and mackerel would just be everywhere. And people just drag a little white hootie, and uh, I had a uh, big old Calcutta sticks that Daddy got off a Japanese ship, and they were about 17, 18 feet long, and the people that I had, it was private. I'd get the harnesses off of Dad that you put your fish in, and so we'd take those and just put them in there and we'd just take that hoodie and put on the end of a 17-foot line and whip it out there and when the mackerel hit, you just lean back and when it finally broke water, here it came. <laughs> and I mean... So no reel or anything else, just like fishing no, with I mean, a cane pole. These people were wealthy people. One of them, I cry when I think about it, he was from Shreveport. Another one, the two were from San Antonio. And they came down for years and years and rented two of the Farley Rock Cottages. And uh, that I remember, because I stayed over there many nights when Mr. Morrison was gone and he left his son, who was about three years younger than I, there at a colored man. And uh, so I'd just stay over here and then, getting into trouble now, and then his other two people, they were kin folks. They had three daughters, and they were my same age. And uh, uh, when their mother was here with them, and their daddy was back taking care of the business, uh, I stayed over, and I was supposed to 
look after them with their mother while we went beach swimming on the beach and uh, boat riding and mm -hmm. so take we, them swimming. <laughs> we have we have Mr. Mr. Hayes who has the resources. He's got a fine boat. We've got your dad who has been out there and has actually brought in a bill of sailfish, I believe right. you do. And so we have a coming together of a couple of guys who have the resources between them and they have the motivation between them to learn about bill fishing right. on the Texas coast. So dad talked to you know, showed them the map and they made the connections and the arrangements to get into Mexico determined that the road was traversable. That was Mr. Hafe made Mr. Half and Mr. Half and, and Mr. Pryor, I don't know. Right, right. Both between the two <clears> of them. <throat> and so they proceeded to make this special trailer to put the Olita on <laughs> and bought it. Remember it was a white truck and uh, no air conditioning. <laughs> and uh, so in April of thirty nine well, before they did that, well, in probably March, Dad went to Beaumont and picked up a load of seasoned cypress for Mr. Albert Farley to make him a boat while they were gone. And uh, in late or mid-April, they put the boat on in Corpus, which there's a picture of that, and headed off west. And uh, Dad had this uh, helper, several He's in several pictures, and I'd love to find his name because people don't know the details see, of what happened here. And uh, as I recall, it was a total 15-day trip driving, but it was five days from Nogales to Wimus with an Indian guide, occasionally picked one up, over dirt roads, that were used by mule-drawn freight wagons. And they were in the process of building a railroad now. And uh, that took five days for that trip. 250 miles, but took five days. To arrive in Guamas. To arrive in Guamas. And then in, we saw in the archive pictures, in Guamas, she looked like she was moored on a brick wall. Yes, I was the harbor at this <laughs> Hotel Plaza de Cortez. Plaza de Cortez. Mm -hmm. Which years later, the owner of the Hotel Plaza de Cortez, no, the lock, no, in Santa Fe, family owned the. La Fonda? Uh, no, oh, no, the La Fonda is a hotel. Yes. The La Posada. It is called the La Posada. It's right, right off the square. Uh, in conversation, he said, well, that's my daddy's motel. And so uh, I produced some pictures for him. <laughs> so just a little side part more there. But those were the boats that were there. And uh, literally, as dad said, you caught sailfish within you know, half a mile because the water dropped off real fast. Who did your dad find to teach him? Tell me about what, what you heard about that linkage. A Mexican. Some yeah. of the Mexican boys down there. So he would well, like he, he charter would. and say, I want to charter with you today, but I'm providing my own boat. Yeah, well, the Mexican boys had uh, little boats with little outboards on them. Okay. I think maybe one of them is in the picture there. And uh, they didn't even hardly use outriggers. But Dad went with the understanding you don't need it, an outrigger. And uh, so the Mexican boys kind of taught them the art of doing it, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> How would the Mexican boys get the baits outside the wake of the boat? Was that important? No, not It was not? No. Because they were running a little outboards anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, they had little little poles, yeah, maybe five or six feet long, to hold as Dad explained to me, but the Dad had some 12, 15 foot outriggers. Right, right. And, uh, Did Olita, because the trip was repeated in 40, 41, and 46, 47? Uh, 47, I believe. 47. Did the, the Olitas... War, excuse me, the war was over in what, August 45. 45. 
and they still could not get papers to go in 46. Nor could they get papers to go in see, third time, 42. No. That's reading they didn't go. No, you were going to go in 40, 41, and 47. I just saw the dates. Did the Alita stay there all this time? What happened to the Alita? Well, they would bring it back. Okay. It was a 1,350 mile road trip each time. Each time? And then he would put it back in the water, put each it in his boathouse. It's on that one picture you're going to scan. And uh, I'm going to guess, <laughs> I came home to service 52, 53, 54. Somewhere about 53, 54. Uh, um, I think his name Larry, that had begun to work for Mr. Howell full time. He uh, did a stupid thing. His dad always said, you're stupid when you burn your boat up while you're filling the gas tank up. So he burned the Olita up. And I believe Mr. Howell was already gone. And so little Hugh started buying and building yachts. Was that a fumes in the bills where it got it? No. Putting, putting gas in the in the tank. Okay, static and electricity maybe or probably we don't know. You just and the old boat that he had had years before the same thing happened. It burned up. Mm. Mm. And as a kid growing up, I remember half a dozen boats that tied up there in a ranchers pass, gas in the bilge, right. blow it up. All right. Dad had a ritual that that would not happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was so safety conscious. A little sidebar right there on that. He boarded the Potomac, and they were given a tour of it. And he told the captain, you get this bilge cleaned out or you'll, the Coast Guard captain will shut you down. <laughs> so right. they pumped the bilge of the Potomac out. It was gasoline all over it. Absolutely. It may not have been enough to create it, but Dad was so conscious of that. Absolutely. Even boarded somebody's boat. Absolutely. I ran the inboard for years and I was very conscious on, okay. um, you know, as they say, evacuate the bills, blow the bills. Dad never let bills. anybody board the boat until he had lifted the, I didn't either. the engine box, stuck his head down and smelled and Absolutely. cranked the boat up and ready to go. Nobody ever boarded the boat. The figure that we have in the paper is 1,350 miles. That would be one way. That's one way. So in order to fish the Gulf of California, we are talking about trailing a boat for 2,700 miles. I think, sir, that you need to go to the Guinness Book of World Records, because I think we have a record for trailing a boat for a fishing uh, trip. And We're going to take just a few minutes break, Mr. Mr. Host, right there, let me Professor say Water, maybe? Let me say one yeah. thing. Go ahead. And Mr. Howe surely arrived the 1st of May and left the end of May. He fished the whole month of May. They were friends. You know. Frank it on, Frank it on. And uh, as I run into people when I moved to Dallas, like Senator Yarbrough and his brother Captain Yarbrough always called him, they'd call me, hey, have lunch with me today. Or your dad told me he's coming up in the uh, when fishing season's over, bring him downtown. So I did. By that time, he had established some customers in my company. And the time he'd get through with them, about 11 o'clock, I'd walk him over to the Texas Bank building and up to the the two lawyers' office. And I think uh, Yarbrough was still senator at that time. And uh, they took him to the petroleum club to eat at this one one particular time my boss and I had gone to the petroleum club it's on top of the LTV tower and, and the whole top floor is the restaurant with glass all around it and typically you have those little round come and go tables you know people just come and go one at a time and I looked clear across and over on the other side I mean there was a crowd of people and I looked and their dad <laughs> <laughs> and so I, uh, Tony, my boss, we walked over there, and uh, uh, I don't remember. I remember uh, 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 the guy that was shot with Kennedy. Uh, uh, oh, Connolly. Connolly. He was there at the table, and uh, so he introduced me to everybody. And uh, so uh, 
about two o'clock, I called and said, hey, I'd come over and pick up Dad. And they said, no, we'll bring him home tonight. We're having a party out at the country club. <laughs> and so I think they invited all of his customers in the Dallas area. <laughs> and uh, But you know, to Dad, they were just, I mean, who's going to show up to, to a spur of the moment dinner at the country club out on Highway 35, uh, Interstate 35? But uh, these people were just friends. And... Uh, if you're ready, I'll ready. We'll crank on the camera. If you're ready, we're on. The, yep, we're, we're mm -hmm. going. It's on. Um, the understanding then is the trips to Guamos. After the first trip, the first trip was a learning trip yep. to acquire the skills for bill fishing. Mm -hmm. Then the trips after that, the three remaining trips would be not so much learning, it just became something that Mr. Mr. Hal wanted, Mr. Hal wanted and it, he enjoyed that, and yeah. your dad was the boatman. Dad was. He responsible to get the uh, Olita there and back, you know. And the helper, who I'd love to find his name. Right. I want to ask around some people. Tell me about your, your dad's charter, offshore charter business after the 1939 learning trial. In other words, he okay. brought back skills. Okay, he came back, let's see, the fish and lay left in May. Mid-June, he returned. And uh, more or less got rid of the Olita in her shed. And uh, Mr. Farley had the boat about ready. And there are a couple of pictures of the boat. Is that the Lucille? Huh? The Lucille. And they towed it from the, where they put it in the water over where the south end of town, and they towed it around through the drawbridge back over to the next block down, or where the road comes over. And Dad had a stall that he had built, and he had a lift so he could crank his boat up and clean the bottom off, and uh, then that was his regular stall to park it and then within a year he built a boathouse right next to it. And so uh, he got the boat, the engine then put on and everything was ready to go. And uh, I want to say early to mid-August, mother, my two, my brother and I climbed on and we headed to Port Aransas, uh, introducing the Lucille as Dad said, with the outriggers flying, and everybody wanted to know what they were. And uh, he then began to, already had charters arranged, and the first few were just go tarpon fishing. And uh, he made contact with these sports riders from San Antonio. He had close relationship with them and the two sports riders from Houston. Uh, Dick Freeman and Andy Anderson. Now, the boat was was your dad's boat, or yes, what? no, that was Dad's boat. That was Dad. Lucille was Dad. Your Dad's that boat, not dad's house boat. boat. Okay. No, prior to that, for charter, he used a shrimp boat. Okay. And uh, it was after about two weeks. It was still August when he convinced them that he could get them back, <laughs> and they could take pictures. But they could not bring any fish in because they were going to catch and release. And so they went out and caught a tarp and a piece and headed offshore. And there was a fellow here, and I met him the same time I met the guy that was the deckhand. He said, I told your dad I want to go on that trip. So dad had a deckhand who was an older person mm -hmm. and the two sport riders. And they went out and came in. 3.30, 4 o'clock that afternoon, and had six flags flying. So would you think it would be fair to put August 1939 That's it. as the first offshore charter endeavor yes. from Port of Rangers Docks? That's right. They call it offshore past the whistling buoy. Let's put it that way. Now, Whistling's, is the whistling buoy four miles? I always used to think it was six miles. You had the belt, you had the entrance buoys, you had the bell buoy, then you had the whistling buoy. Maybe I'm thinking of the bell buoy. I, th I think it is six miles. Yeah, I believe it's yeah. a whistling buoy. 
Okay. When the uh, Lucille came running down the Aransas Channel into Turtle Cove, she had her outriggers. Straight up. Straight up. And people were fascinated. They didn't know what those were. Now, you mentioned that the six flags flying, was that... Represented six sailors. Right, but was that something that was new? Was that done in Florida? Was that, It was done in Mexico. Mexico. It was done in Mexico. So that was a custom that came from Mexico. And I'm sure that by then they were fishing in Florida too, but it, it was just the custom. And that Dad had little blue triangle flags, maybe about this long, just nothing but a piece of blue canvas laced around, and eventually I saw some that somebody had embroidered a sailfish on or something like that. So that was the signal that I had caught, a, or how many fish you had caught. When, you, when your dad finished a charter, mm -hmm. let's talk about this charter right here with the, the, the sports artist. He came back and did he more Lucille in Aransas Pass? No. He moored Lucille in Port Aransas? Moored her through the summer fishing. And when the summer gulf fishing was over with, he went to Aransas. Okay. Then he had his duck hunting business already established with the shrimp boat. Okay, so, so he would keep Lucille at deep sea? Do you know where he moored her? Every one of them. Every one of them. Over the years, you know, everybody had offered him a little better right. deal. <laughs> so he would moor Lucille here for, is that the 100 days? That That's what he always used to say. Give me, a, after he got rid of his duck seed, duck honey, and you know that, he said, in other words, he was, give me a 100 days in the summertime, and the rest of the time is for me to go fishing with my friends, my boys, my grandkids, and Mama and I to travel. But the hundred days to make a living or yeah, the hundred? To make the living. To make a living. That was the work. That's when he made his money. Exactly, exactly. So the Louis, the, the Louis, the Lucille was here during the hundred days and then he moved her back to Aransas Pass? Mm -hmm. Did he take her out of the water? Uh, well, he would take the boat up because he had his own. Uh, he would lift it up at least twice a year to clean it off and paint the bottom. Right and then it would be ready for duck season. And back in those early days, duck season was 90 days. And then when duck season was over with, you had to get the decoys out of the blinds and get your skiffs put up and uh, the decoys put up and uh, my brother and I would paint them about every third year <laughs> and uh, get ready for the, and he took the heads off the engines ever twice a year cleaned them up, had them read whatever you do to an engine when you tear it down, clean it up. And then in, I came on the service in May of 54, and he had acquired this other boat, I don't remember this, what his name was, and that's when he sold the Olita to a fellow over here at Port Rangers. Who sold Olita? Daddy did. No, uh, excuse me, the Lucille. Lucille, yep. Lucille. Uh, the Lucille. Lucille's power plants were Packard, General Motors, do you remember? Uh, they were Chrysler, Chrysler. Che Chevrolet Marine. Chevrolet Marine, okay. I could expand on that up to the next book right. or two, but go ahead. I, I'd like to, to keep pursuing the offshore okay. aspect of this because Mark and I have just done for the museum um, a, a quite a bit of research for the new exhibit there, which is sport fishing. Mm -hmm. And so we are very interested in bay fishing and, and, and certainly offshore fishing. And what we have discovered in our research is that the Tarpon Rodeo, the very famous tournament, started in 1932. And our guess right now, uh, our, our, our educated guess, is that in 1941, the Tarpon Rodeo included another tournament branch called the Deep Sea Roundup. Can you speak to the Deep Sea Roundup? Yes. Not necessarily by name. In 39, so you only had the tail end of the season to sail fish. I don't recall, and I can't say one way or the other, where Charles Urschel already had his boat here, uh, the Harpoon, and whether he immediately put on outriggers and where Mary Bramber O'Connor 
heard about it, it came down. But the next year, those three boats, Charles Urschel's Harpoon and Mrs. Mrs. O'Connor's Siesta. Siesta. And it wasn't called one because eventually she got a Siesta too. That's another story. Okay. And then Daddy. And I recall one other private boat that was friends of Daddy's customer for the Tarpon Rodeo the next year in the sailfish division. And that couple had booked up for, well, up through 49, I know, because they fished the tournament here and then went to Port Isabel with Dad. So Mr. Adair from 1940 up to 49 was his customer during the which became the Deep Sea Roundup, but in 1940 was the first year that sailfish was a part of it. Okay, let me say that again. Okay. That in 1940, the Tarpon Rodeo, still the Tarpon Rodeo, instituted a new fishing domain or channel, and that was offshore. Well, it was sailfish. It was sailfish. Sailfish. Do you, do you think that in 1940 they named it the Deep Sea Roundup, or did they just said we have a new division? I'm going to say it a year or two later. That they said this is going to be called the Deep Sea Roundup? Because, you know, say by 1941, you know, a lot of people had gotten, I say a lot of people, maybe a dozen people were interested. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to, going to call it the Sailfish Tournament or the Tarpon Rodeo? And somewhere right in there, when you had enough people that were interested, and I'm going to say most of them were private, private boats that were sailing. This is very gracious because Mark and I have guessed correctly on this one. <laughs> we guessed correctly. We, we put together the same reasoning that you're, you're telling us. We, we, uh, because of the time I ran the, that private boat, I got out of high school in 49, so it was 49 and 50. And it was a nice little 28-foot twin-screw Chris Craft tied up. And I guess it was Henry Studem under Ed Terrence, the same building. And I'm going to say there wasn't, in the whole harbor, a half a dozen charter local boats. Yeah, yeah, in 48, 49, wow. So, you know, it didn't become... Now there were probably be, there were uh, probably as many private boats as there were charter fishing off, quote offshore. Mm -hmm. Can you think of a, I'm sure you can another charter boat captain's name in this early game? There was certainly Mr. Minter. Uh, can you think of some other folks that uh, got very interested and started running offshore charters? Bubba Molina? Yes. That's a name that comes to me. 